From Hopkins, we have Linda Costa and Bob Feroli, Nursing Pharmacy Collaboration on Medication Reconciliation, a novel approach to information management. Thank you, Jose. Uh, well, uh, Linda Costa and I are pleased to be here today uh, to give you an update on our project uh, looking at medication reconciliation and the use of a nurse pharmacist team uh, to try to deal with this very difficult thing that many of us are struggling with. Uh, here is the outline of our presentation, starting with the background, just a little bit of uh, nomenclature. Uh, an adverse drug effect is harm caused by the use of a drug. Uh, often in the literature and in conversation, that's used synonymously with a medication error. Well, it's not actually the same thing. In fact, they relate by this Venn diagram. Uh, some adverse drug events uh, are related to medication errors, but not all. And, and as you can see, the medication errors or the adverse drug events really are made up of two components, those that are preventable, those associated with the medication error, and those that are not preventable. We're going to key on the ones that are preventable. And as a matter of fact, this causes a lot of grief and a lot of excess cost. Uh, the uh, IOM uh, has estimated that each year about 400,000 patients are affected by adverse drug events, those are the preventable ones, at an excess cost of about $3.5 billion, a good chunk of change. So let's then look at one methodology then to decrease adverse drug events, and that is medication reconciliation. Now it turns out that medication reconciliation in fact is defined lots of different ways. The definition we're going to be using is this. It's a process, not a medication list. Medication reconciliation is a process occurring at transitions in care, why, why, whereby medications received by the patient prior to the care transition are considered when developing the next therapeutic plan. That is medication reconciliation. Well, the Joint Commission has certainly recognized the potential uh, importance of medication reconciliation when in 2005 it incorporated medication reconciliation as one of the national patient safety goals. In 2009, Joint Commission recognized that we, the royal we, were having a lot of trouble figuring out how to do medication reconciliation and thinking about how to measure the goodness of medication reconciliation. In fact, Joint Commission continues to say that this is an important component, but has actually stopped grading this until they can figure out how to give us uh, advice and how to measure it. So in 2010, we can expect to see those. Uh, the purpose of the study, then, is to focus on medication reconciliation as a method to improve uh, the, or to reduce adverse drug events. And, in, and what we also wanted to do is do a, a cost-benefit analysis of the process that we used. Now, the methods I'll now turn over to Linda. <laughs> So I want to talk just a moment about the team um, that we put together, who you saw in the uh, last slide. Um, we wanted this, if we had whatever the results were, to be replicable. So what we did is we recruited two clinical nurses um, from the hospital. And these were nurses who um, were actually in active clinical practice, one on a cardiac step-down unit and one an oncology unit, who wanted to come into a research study um, and participate and learn the research process. So they were BSN prepared nurses. They had about five years of experience each, but very different backgrounds. Um, so they became the medication reconciliation nursing team. And we used the clinical pharmacist um, who was on the medicine service already um, to be their support. So the pharmacist served in a consultative role to the nurses. Um, the nurses actually did the intervention and used the pharmacist to clarify any questions that they had when they obtained information. So that's a little bit of background about the actual team. So what we did is we have a thousand bed hospitals, so obviously a three person team couldn't focus on that. So we selected medicine patients as our focus. And the reason for that is one, they often have chronic conditions and usually their admissions are not planned. And we found that um, over 95% of the patients who entered our study had emergency admissions and the rest were pretty much urgent, otherwise coming from a physician's office. 
We also did a second interview, which the nurses did, with the patient, and then they went to other sources of information to complete the medication list. Most of the patients did not have a list when they came into the hospital. So we used the family, and a lot of times we couldn't get the information from the family. So we used other sources, including the electronic medical record, the outpatient record. But the source that surprised us the most was the community pharmacy. Um, they became, the pharmacist in the community became a major source of information for us in completing medication reconciliation. And we thought at first when we wrote this that that was going to be a barrier. But as long as we were able to provide them with some patient information, primarily birth date, we were able to complete the medication list with the community pharmacist help. So it helped us with the intervention more than we thought. It took the nurses an average of 29 minutes to complete the list. So if we think about this being done by our bedside care team, nurses, physicians, and other providers, this is a very difficult task um, to pull caregivers away from the actual patient care to do this type of a complete process. When we found discrepancies that we felt were significant, we talked with the pharmacist as we needed to, and then we talked to the prescriber. We did this intervention about 48 hours after admission, so we allowed the normal care processes to take place. We again did it at discharge. The prescriber is the one who decided if this was an unintended discrepancy. So if the prescriber actually changed the order on admission or discharge, that became a discrepancy.